morning. My name is Katie Yates, and I am a public relations specialist for the main department of inland fisheries and wildlife. Welcome to a special edition of our monthly coffee chat series where I meet with different staff from our department to talk about recreation management and conservation over some coffee. Today I am meeting with our commissioner Judy Camuso to talk about spring fishing, hunting and birding and other ways you can get outside and some department updates. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation at any time by typing your questions and comments into the chat box and we'll answer or questions as time allows and towards the end of our conversation. And this video will be recorded and available on our department's YouTube channel for you to watch later. So thank you so much for joining me today, Judy. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you virtually. Yes, and it's a, a nice rainy no. <laughs> day we're having today. We need to also, it's good. So we've been, uh, we have been having great weather, but, uh, and I know from today's not a great example of that. And I know from your Instagram, you've been out on the water enjoying some fishing. So do yeah. you want to talk a little bit about some spring fishing opportunities? Yeah, there's amazing opportunities right now, pretty much statewide. Um, and I, I try to get out as often as I can, usually at least once a week. Um, and we've had a lot of fun lately catching last weekend. The, I didn't actually post these pictures, but um, caught a, a lot of um, pike and northern pike. And actually, I caught my first chain pickerel, which is really cool. Um, so and it was in a really pretty, really pretty spot. Um, so for me, what I what I particularly like about um, spring fishing is one, I like to go to, well, I like to catch fish, of course, but if we're not catching fish, I'd like to be in a pretty place. Um, and I am happy just if the boat is catching fish, although I do myself like to catch fish. Um, I, I get excited when other people are catching fish too. But this time of year, it's especially exciting for me because there's so many birds returning. So you'd be casting and, you know, trying to catch fish and sort of, sort of figuring out where to, you know, try and, and uh, cast your line. And at the same time, I'm listening to birds returning and singing and, you know, watching for whatever migrants are coming through. I think some of the people I fish with get a little tired of me sometimes. I mean, not sometimes, but regularly, I kind of put my bra down and pull my binoculars up and uh, look around and see, and, you know, I sort of randomly calling out, you know, black and white warbler, palm warbler. <laughs> um, but so for me, this time of year is super exciting because you can do both at the same time. And, um, you know, birds in the spring are so active and visible and noisy that it's, it's a great opportunity to kind of combine both of my passions. So, but where to go as far as where to go in the spring, I would say, um, I would check our, 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 uh, monthly report from our fisheries biologists really have the best feedback on where to go locally and I know some good places near where I live but you know that's a pretty small area compared to opportunities statewide so I would encourage you to check our website and check with the regional staff for, for good spots in your particular area. And can I know, I know I see a lot of comments and questions on our social media channels regarding stocking and yeah. whether or not hatcheries has been, has been stocking. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so they have been stocking at kind of the regular rate. So last year, because of the pandemic, we were concerned about um, not being able to get the fish out if, if something happened with, you know, one of the hatcheries and we didn't have staff or couldn't get in. There was so much unknown and uncertainty. We did stock. Uh, a little bit, a couple of weeks ahead of schedule. And, you know, the truth is with the early stocking, there isn't as there's, there's a higher mortality rate. So um, we prefer to stock, you know, a little bit later in the season and, and can ensure that more fish survive. So um, the hatchery staff have been diligently stocking fish um, all around the state now. And that is updated. We have basically a live update of the stocking report. So folks can go on our website and see where their favorite water bodies ha have been stocked and can take advantage of those resources. Yeah. Great, thank you. I will just note that there are people chiming in in the comments uh, where they're from. So <laughs> I encourage everyone watching, let us know where you're tuning in from. Bodenham, Penobscot, South Portland, Oakland, Chelsea. Very exciting. So let yeah. us know where you're watching from. I think that's super interesting. Yeah. I wish I could see that. Yeah, <laughs> you could watch later and see all, all the great, all the great uh, comments and questions coming in. So, uh, 
Judy, uh, what about free fishing opportunities? We had some excellent participation this past winter with a free yeah. fishing license week where everyone got to try ice fishing, maybe for the first time uh, without having to uh, actually purchase a license. Do we have any opportunities like that coming up in the spring and summer? We will, yes. And as you know, Katie, um, you know, with that uh, winter, or um, you know, this, this, the ice fishing, free ice fishing opportunity we provided, we asked folks to register and to provide a little bit of information so that we can continue to communicate with those people and then kind of figure out um, what, what, how their experience was, what they might need from us for more information or um, what their barriers to continue participation are, if they fished in the past. These are all things that kind of help us as, as you know, um, help us kind of figure out in the future what adjustments we might need to make or what other opportunities we should look to provide to make sure we can um, have opportunities available for everyone. So for sure, um, we will be having some more free fishing opportunities coming up, no, no doubt this spring. I don't think we've decided, I haven't met with the governor yet to, to figure out exactly when those will be, but we will have at least, um, at least one more free fishing opportunity. And we'll try and do the same thing where we have, um, folks register and, um, you know, and give us their email address and let us know kind of what worked or what didn't work and do a follow-up survey. And we'll try and time it. You know, for me, I really like to provide opportunities where uh, people uh, or families can get out as well. So some, some timing where there could be opportunity to take um, kids out. So, uh, but that remains to be seen when that will be, but we will be offering some kind of uh, free fishing event coming up. And I will note that if, if people are, are trying fishing maybe for the first time during those opportunities to go without a license, the fishing license is actually a really great value. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a whole, well, I don't know, depending on where you buy it, several months of, of you know, getting outdoors and having fun. And it's, it's you can literally fish like every single weekend in the state every year, you know, it's amazing opportunities to tremendous value. And for me in particular, it was a great way to get outside in the winter. Cause I don't ski. Um, so I do like to snowshoe and I do some winter hiking, but you know, uh, ice fishing is a great way to get outside all, all winter long. And, you know, so with all of those opportunities and, and by and large fishing doesn't require a tremendous amount of equipment. So, you know, you, you can do it relatively inexpensively and have opportunities to get outside and, and enjoy fishing and just, and just being outside and being in the outdoors. And a lot of these activities for me as well are really social. And so there are great ways to see other people. And right now, you know, the outdoors is like one of the best places to be. They've shown that the pandemic really doesn't or the virus doesn't spread nearly as well outside. And so, you know, we are encouraging people to get outside and take advantage of outdoor activities um, right now, especially. Um, and obviously I would like that to continue for those folks for, you know, well beyond this pandemic, but um, it, it is a tremendous value for, for a pretty modest fee. It's not, you know, it's certainly less than a dinner out anywhere. Um, for a couple so and it gives you a year a year's worth of activities so i think it's a great value yeah absolutely and it's so good for your mental health to be yeah. outside and i often you know my husband loves fishing and i'll just join him sometimes and i'll bring a book right even, and even if i'm not going to be casting the whole time i i will just enjoy being outside enjoy connecting with nature right. or paddling the canoe whatever we happen to be how we happen to be fishing that day and yeah. and i think others are, are kind of seeing the same thing as what you're describing because we have had a jump in participation. Yeah. Yeah. So both hunting and angling have increased. And I think the last uh, statistic I saw for the first three months of the year, the fishing licenses were up almost 18%, um, which is year to, so that's year to date. So that, that will play out over the course of the year, of course, but that is great news. Um, and likewise, I just attended the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's annual meeting. And, you know, our increase in hunting participation was up um, more than almost any state in the country and certainly one of the highest in the Northeast. And when you consider that Maine is already one of the sort of uh, as a proportion to our population, one of the highest, we've got one of the highest participation rates in our outdoor activities, in fact, 
I think we're third in the country. So for us to grow by that amount is just phenomenal and just sort of proves that the people of the state are really connected to outdoor activities and they want new opportunities and people are looking for new ways to engage in the outdoors. So I think we have a lot of um, different ways, regardless of what your interests are. I think there's lots of ways that you can engage in the outdoors and with the department at the same time. I think the the breeding bird atlas is another great way for folks that don't hunt or fish, but do like to be outside or look at birds. And um, that's in its fourth year. And that project is looking at is sort of a snapshot of bird populations and where they are in the state. Hasn't We haven't had a bird uh, atlas done since the late 70s. So um, this is an enormous effort on the department's uh, behalf with community um, scientists from all over the state helping and collect data and birders of all levels are welcome to participate. So um, if you like watching birds in your backyard, you can engage and share your information and that data will be used to help make management recommendations for a whole, you know, all of our breeding birds. And we, we do a similar thing in the winter as well. So it's great ways for folks to engage. Yeah, let's talk about birding. If someone is new to birding, what should they what should they be looking for? I know that even just going outside in my backyard, I'm starting to notice different songs and different sounds and I'm, I'm picking those up and I'm able now to identify them a little bit right. differently than you know a distinct sound versus just a cacophony of, of bird noises. Uh, so if someone's new, what are they looking for and what's important for them to report to the bird atlas if they're looking to get involved that way? Sure. So for the bird atlas in, in, in particular, there's sort of a whole, there's a website that we can maybe share with folks and there's a very specific way to engage and, and share information, um, including like your location, what sort of you know, activity was the bird doing? Could you tell if it was a male or female? Was it on a nest? So there's all these different categories um, that you probably should go on the atlas webpage to get more details about that. But for folks that are just new to birding or just getting interested in birding. For me, I mean, my favorite thing about birding is that similar to fishing, that you can do it every day of the year, any place in the world and in every weather condition. So there is never a day that you cannot go outside and find birds. So, I mean, I don't particularly like to go out in the middle of a blizzard, but <laughs> um, you know, birds are active in our, in our, in our area, especially here in Maine year round and there's different behaviors. There's different birds that are here seasonally. There's different birds here in the winter than they're here in the summer. We get birds that migrate through in the spring and fall that are different than the birds are here in the winter and the, in the summer. So it's an enormous opportunity um, that you can do wherever you are. And my, my family and friends make fun of me because I bring my binoculars with me pretty much everywhere. And so it will be going into like Hadlock Field to watch a sea dog and people are like, why do you have your binoculars? Like what's wrong with you? And I'm like, this is going to be Nighthawks flying over. There'll be birds flying over at Hadlock Field in downtown Portland. There's great opportunities for birding everywhere you are in the state. Um, you know, and what I like about it as well is, I, so I am uh, maybe a little bit of a, like, a nerd. <laughs> and um, I keep a list of the birds that I see, but what every year. So I keep an annual list. And, but what it does it, is it prompts me to go to different habitats or different places. So I know if I wanna go see glossy ibis, I need to go down to Scarborough Marsh and look for, for ibis down there. Or if I want to find a yellow-billed cuckoo, that will prompt me to go over Brownfield Bog and check out a totally different habitat. Um, so, I, I mean, those are some of the reasons why I like birding. I think if you're just getting started in birding, the first thing and the, really the only thing you need is um, a pair of binoculars. And so that's what I would start with is, is a pair of binoculars. There are lots of apps on your phone now. So, a, a, you know, years ago, I would have said you probably want to have a nice field guide. Um, and I still do like to I like the field guide to that I kind of review and look through. But you can do a lot of that stuff on your phone now pretty easily. There's a number of um, birding apps out there that you can download and, you know, sort by size or color, a whole, whole bunch of different ways you can utilize those apps. But, um, and, and I, I encourage people to do just what you suggested, Katie, sort of go out and get familiar with the things in your backyard. And then you'll get familiar with the sounds that the birds in your yard make. And then you'll pay, the, the more you do that, 
then you'll start to notice, well, wait, I don't know that song. That's different. I've heard that before. Um, and then you become, you sort of broaden your um, scope of awareness, I guess. So, um, so I think some people who are watching who think of us strictly as a fish and game agency might be right. surprised by all the great work that we do for non-game bird species, such as we songbirds do. and wading birds. Yeah. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that and maybe how people at home can support the good work that we do for birds in the state? Sure. I mean, department does all kinds of work on a whole suite of non-game species, including you know, listed species, threatened and endangered species, um, wading birds, you know, waterfowl, some, some that are harvested, but some that are not. Um, we do all kinds of surveys on all these species. We've got the breeding bird atlas. We have a heron, heron watch group. Um, we do monitoring of river birds. We have folks working on peregrine falcons, bald eagles. Um, the department really is responsible for the recovery of bald, I mean, with our partners and the landowners of the state, but really took the initiative to recover bald eagles in the state. Um, and so we do a whole suite of different projects that focus on non-game species um, and many, you know, uh, endangered and threatened species. So piping plovers and least terns are a good example. Plovers are back now in southern Maine. I think we're up to close to 50 nesting, 50 pair on the beaches already. So we work with Maine Audubon and that um, program to help recover those birds. And, you know, beyond that, we also have a group of biologists that work just on invertebrates. And so they work on reptiles, some work on reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates. We've got folks that are working on black racer snakes. We've got folks that are working on turtles. Um, and I think that's something that is amazing and that we should all be so proud of because not all states work on the full suite of wildlife. A lot of them really focus just on a much smaller um, core of species and your biologists work on everything from moose to mayflies and that's pretty awesome and because of course all those things are interconnected and if you don't have a good invertebrate brace you are not going to have a good you know uh, predator base or prey base like the, they're all, the whole systems are connected so it's essential that we work on all those things and the department also does a lot of work on habitat management and acquisition and we work with private landowners to help them manage their land for how they want um, what species they want to have or highlight on their property so we do a lot more than um, just fish and game but we do a lot of work on fish and game as well. Kind of a, a holistic approach yeah. to management certainly and I'm curious, we've done a, a series of spring presentations. You've probably heard me mention those if the people at home have heard me talk about them and maybe have tuned into some of them. So uh, we'll post a link for some of those so that you can check them out. The ones that are relevant to our conversations are great staff of biologists have been doing presentations about the work they're doing. Judy, can people review the research and management reports that have been put together by our staff? Absolutely. Yeah, those are all up on our website. And so we used to print the research and management report once a year. And we've sort of changed uh, our approach to that. And now we print it or we produce it in kind of sections. So there's kind of uh, game species and then birds and um, reptiles and amphibians and dangerous species. They're kind of done in chapters now. And all of those are posted on our website. They're beautifully designed. They've got tons of information. If you are like me and get into some of the nitty gritty details and they, you like looking at statistics and numbers and population trends, stuff like that, um, the research and management reports are phenomenal resource. And they are on our website and available. You can download them and print them out or um, and you can actually compile them and, and print out all of the whole year's worth of them. So they're a tremendous um, resource for folks. And if you want to learn more about what the agency is working on and ways that you can engage, they have all that information as well. Thank you. And you did ah. mention game species, and it's pretty <laughs> timely because tomorrow is youth day for spring turkey season. Uh, are you thinking about getting out for turkey season this year? I will for sure be getting out. I... Um, I cannot get out before probably at least Thursday of next week. So we've got some heavy lifting coming with the legislature um, this next these next couple of weeks. So my schedule is a little bit tighter than 
um, I might want it to be for opening week of turkey season. But yeah, I am excited to go out. And so I'll probably go out maybe Thursday and next Saturday. I'm trying to do a little scouting this weekend to see um, where uh, kind of nailed on where we're going to go. But we have been using up some um, turkey from last year and we made this uh, like not pulled pork, but like turkey leg in a, in the slow cooker and, and cooked it like pulled pork meat is so delicious. It was phenomenal. So now I'm sort of obsessed with getting uh, some more turkeys and we made turkey burgers. I made like turkey stroganoff and um, turkey tacos. So um, I love eating wild game. It's my favorite thing to eat. So um, I'm excited to go out and harvest my hopefully two toms this year. I will give a quick shout out to the cooking videos that the yes. department has put together. They're very cool. And we'll post the link to those uh, in the comments so that everyone can check those out and some recipes. And we encourage others to share their favorite wild game recipes. Uh, Judy, is turkey hunting a good opportunity for folks who might be new to hunting? So I think turkey hunting is one of the better gateways for people to get started in. And because primarily it's, it's really active and we have a pretty robust turkey population and particularly in, in the Southern uh, half of the state. And so there's usually good action. If you can go out with someone who's good at calling or you know, using a box call, um, it's so, it's so much fun. And it is so, so like high, high like excitement and um, you know, the bird calls and then you might call back and then the birds calling and the males are, Kind of you can hear them like when they sort of like put their wings together and make like little vibration noises and um i i think it is so exciting and most of the time when you go turkey hunting there's some kind of activity so i think it's a real good way to get people engaged as opposed to say deer hunting which sometimes you might go out for a day or two or three days and might not actually see a deer um and that's maybe a, a little bit more of a challenge to continue but I, so I like turkey hunting as a as a first ex exposure for folks because I think there's a lot of activity and um it sort of gets you hooked pretty quickly I think likewise I like up on game uh you know up on birds for that as well a lot I like I like act, a lot of activity and it's also turkey hunting you know you can do it and, and be done and get to work by nine or 10 in the morning. It, you, you can, it, it doesn't have to take all day. You know, it used to be up until, gosh, I don't remember when it was, but maybe five years ago, it used to be that the season, that the timing ended at noon. You could only hunt in the morning. They've extended the time now, but um, so, I mean, it is, it isn't, it doesn't require a, a huge time amount, you know, amount of time, but also, most people live in relative proximity to areas with turkeys. So you also don't have to travel terribly far to go to someplace that has good turkey hunting. So I encourage folks to get out and get landowner permission and do some scouting, figure out where those turkeys are roosting and where they might come down in the morning and, um, it, you know, either go out with someone that you know, or try and find someone that can give you some tips on, on where to go. And, um, but I think turkey hunting is a great way to, to get engaged. Certainly so a registered main guide might be a, a good right. option for folks if they're if they're just new to hunting in general and some guides will have equipment for people yeah. to use so you don't have Absolutely. to make that big investment up front. Right. Judy I know last year we waived tagging due to right. the pandemic. Is is tagging required this year for spring turkey hunting? Tagging is required this year and you know we the department uses that data from the spring harvest uh, pretty extensively to assess the population of turkey statewide. And that is how we determine what the bag limit is. So um, we waived it last year because of the, the issues with the pandemic and having to be in close proximity to people. And many of the small tagging stations had closed anyway. So we didn't think there was gonna be places for people to go to actually tag, um, tag the turkeys, but most of that has opened back up and there, there should be plenty of places for folks to go and tag turkeys. And, you know, that's data that we really rely on um, to help with the management of the species statewide. So we are um, requiring folks to tag turkeys this fall, this spring. And, and what if someone is 
um, new to hunting and they haven't had the opportunity to take hunter ed yet, are we, we offer hunter ed online now. So right. that maybe is a little bit easier for folks to kind of overcome that barrier. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. So we started offering online, a fully online course um, last September. This is something that the department had been working on for years and have been kind of gradu- gradually moving in that direction. The pandemic, of course, kind of catapulted us into um, making that leap, uh, you know, kind of last year in, immediately, maybe a couple months earlier than we would have. But we've been pushing for this for a long time. Um, and we had, I think, 7,000 people um, take the Hunter Ed class in between the months of September and December. And in a normal year, we have about 3,500 people take that class in, in the whole year. So we had more than uh, twice as many people in a, in a quarter of the year take Hunter Ed online. So what was really interesting for me, two things, the key demographics uh, of the folks that took the online Hunter Ed were more than 50% of the people were between the ages of 18 and 35 and 37% of the people that took Hunter Ed online were female, were women. Um, and so for me, that shows that there was a significant barrier to those folks entering entering into the, you know, the world of hunting. And so I was really, really excited with those numbers. And we just had this week, um, the other commissioners from the Northeast met and we spent probably two and a half hours talking about um, online Hunter Ed and the benefits and potential downsides to it. Um, We met with the folks, the International Hunter Ed Education Association and we, and, and talked about what other states are doing, how it's working in other parts of the country and overwhelmingly hugely successful in the Northeast last year. And I won't have the statistic exactly right, but it'll be close. Um, the number of men that took Hunter Ed online increased by 400%, 400% more took it Hunter Ed last year. And the number of women that took online Hunter Ed last year increased by over 650%. So that is like phenomenal numbers. Um, and so there's obviously there was a barrier. Obviously there are people that who because of the pandemic, we're interested in getting outside and finding new ways to engage in the outdoors. Um, but, you know, I think part of it is in here in Maine, our numbers were higher than in any, any place else. And I think a lot of it is the work that Katie, you guys are doing, trying to help connect people and, and give them the tools they need to get them outside and make them aware of all the opportunities that we have. Um, and, you know, I think it's just an, an amazing um, chance for folks. And, you know, in addition to the online Hunter Ed, we still offer the in-person courses for folks that I, I'm as like a former educator, I believe that we need to address all the different learning styles and lots of people learn better in person. So we'll continue to do that. And they'll continue to be the hybrid version where you can do part online, part in person, um, but we'll continue to offer the fully online program. I mean, it, at this point now, over 80% of the states all offer a fully online uh, program. So um, we will continue to do that. And in addition to that, and I know you've been talking about that, these and some of these uh, programs, we have a whole series of next step programs to help people who are new to hunting, help them take the next step to maybe learn how to call a turkey or uh, maybe learn how to set up a tree stand or how to track a deer. And so there are all these next step programs that will help people move. So you have your hunting license, right? But if you've never been hunting before, that doesn't, you don't necessarily know what to do, where to go, how to do it, how how to gut a deer. There's still a lot of barriers that I think um, our volunteers can help folks um, kind of work through those challenges in particular. So I'm really excited about the opportunities for um, growth in this, in this world. And I mean, really like the pandemic has been an an enormous challenge in many ways. And in some ways we've learned a lot about, and we've grown. And I think some of these opportunities, they're not going to go away. We're not going to stop having, you know, these kind of, um, virtual meetings and connections and and they've allowed people to engage in a way that we haven't really done before so the technology kind of advanced um you know just sort of just kept kept going and going and now we have these opportunities where we can we can engage with hundreds of people at at one time where i know i was with someone and they were like ah there was only like 75 people on the 
on the Zoom or whatever. And I'm like, 75 people. Like if you went to a presentation and there were 75 people in the room, you'd be like, oh my God, there's a lot of people here. But now, you know, that's just commonplace. It's commonplace to have a couple hundred people on, uh, you know, a meeting like this and, and from all over the state. So you're not limited to the geography. So I think we're going to continue to offer these programs um, forever. And, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll evolve and adapt. But I think it's, you know, it's a really exciting time. I feel like we are on like this kind of this cusp, this pinnacle of like change. And um, I think here in Maine, we are ahead of the game and we're leading the way. Yes, I have absolutely loved the opportunity to have these coffee chats and yeah. not only have a conversation with someone from my department, in a time when we're pretty much isolated in our homes, mm -hmm. but also to have the opportunity to see the people at home interacting with us and able to ask us questions. And on that note, you mentioned that there was a heavy week in the legislature and someone asked what you meant by that. Are there any major uh, things happening there that people should be aware of? <laughs> so there are lots of things happening at the legislature. Um, we are at that, like that, uh, like the timeline of the legislature where they have to be have all their bills reported out within the next week or two. So um, there are a number of public hearings still that we have to have. And then, so the legislative process is generally two parts. There's a, there's a public hearing where uh, the bill sponsor presents the bill and the rationale for the bill. And then people, uh, including the department, weigh in whether they support or oppose or think there should be amendments to the bill. And then there's a work session where the committee, our legislative committee of jurisdiction, kind of works through the kinks and they ask questions and they debate and and then they they may vote to um, pass the bill, they may not pass the bill, they may amend the bill, or they, they can carry the bill over. Um, so we're just at that place where they're in like a time crunch to get all the bills reported completed. So we have several bills um, that still have to be voted on and so some of them i think that are probably most interesting sunday hunting has has come up again there's three sunday hunting bills that will have their work sessions um next week there are some around just hunting methods and tools um, that will come up next week there is potentially an endangered species bill but that hasn't been um it hasn't been assigned to the committee yet so we're not quite sure what they're going to do with that so there are a lot of um Bills are, we have a couple bills in department bills um, that still have to be addressed. Most of our bills are the department, the bills the department put forward, at least the, the one that we still have to kind of resolve is the omnibus bill. And that is mostly just a list of like corrections, things that are inaccurate in the law, but not real significant changes to anything. But um, there's, if you go on to the, uh, state of Maine website, you can, you can just Google Maine legislature and you, it'll take you right to their website and, and you just go on to committees and you can go on to the Fish and Wildlife Committee and you should be able to see the entire list of bills and, and their progress, where they're at, whether they've been, uh, the public hearings happen, the work session, you'll see the, you'll see the calendar for the next uh, week at least. And um, you can see whether it's been reported out or whether it passed and, or, or, or didn't pass. Um, and then uh, I think all the bills have to be, I'm trying to find a calendar, but by the middle of May, I think we have to be, the committee has to have voted on almost all of the bills. They can still do language review and kind of tweak, finalize, or, or correct some. Sometimes the analyst, the legal analyst will make some corrections to language just to make sure that the bill is legally um, accurate and gonna function. So. It's a complicated process, and um, if you're not familiar with the legislative process, I encourage you to go onto the website and to figure out who your local legislator is, whether you're a senator or your representative, and um, you know review the review the bills that are going before our committee. And um, if you're interested now, it's relatively easy. Likewise, for a lot of the Zoom, you know the legislature is convening over Zoom, so you can. Register ahead. You do have to register ahead if you want to provide testimony, but just 30 minutes ahead, so it's not huge, um, huge time sink. And you can go in and you, and you can zoom in and provide testimony on on any of the upcoming bills. So, it's a it's a learning process for sure.
but it's so interesting. Yeah, it is. And it's important for people to, yeah. if they feel passionate about something to get, yeah. find ways to participate in that. Process. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's easier now than ever. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the legislature makes the laws. And, and so people often think, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And we, we, we don't make the laws. <laughs> the legislature makes the laws and we enact them and enforce them. But we might, we try to guide that process, of course, and we weigh in on those. But um, the, the legislature is the body in the government that makes the laws, not the department. What else you got, Katie? <laughs> So uh, I, you mentioned deer earlier, and we had quite a mild winter. Are yeah. we looking to in, uh, at an increase in any deer permits for this fall? I would expect so. So it's been a very mild winter, pretty much statewide. And so I do believe I, I would be very surprised if the biologists don't recommend uh, additional any deer permits or a large number of any deer permits. And that sort of ties back to the last question about the legislature. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the bills um, that was brought forward, there were three bills related to deer issues. And um, one of them was carried over and um, directed the department to convene a group of stakeholders to try and review the antlerless deer permit system and to try and make it a little bit less complicated and so they'll be looking at a number of options. They'll be looking at um, maybe some areas of the state that might have uh, multiple deer as an option, um, perhaps having more of a expanded archery approach and that you could purchase an additional uh, permit and to, to harvest a second deer. Um, but by and large, in some parts of the state, we are not meeting our, man particularly Southern Maine, not meeting our management goals. Um, and so that would be, trying to find ways to expand opportunity for folks, provide additional opportunity and to help us achieve our management objectives a little bit uh, more closely. So that will we'll report that back um, in January to the committee. Um, so for this fall, it will be the same as it's been. So folks can apply for an NEDR permit and um, you can apply for, I encourage folks to apply for bonus permits. And I would expect, I, I haven't seen the numbers yet, but I would expect we would have at least as many as we had last year, which was a lot. And I think most everybody that applied for a bonus permit, except for me, got one. Um, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> so it is in fact a true lottery. <laughs> so last year we had our moose lottery online yeah. And uh, we're going to be hosting our 2021 Moose Lottery online in, uh, on June 12th. What should people expect from that? I'm sure they're, you're mentioning uh, bonus permits for deer. Let's talk about right. the That's permitting fine. process for moose. Yeah, so <clears throat> this, this, this year will be a little bit different in that it will be online. And I think everybody, it's a little disappointing for everyone because I think people love the Moose Lottery. I mean, I am constantly amazed at the thousands of people that come um, to the moose lottery every year, no matter where we have it in the state, Presque Isle, Caribou, you know, Belgrade, Belfast, wherever, Scout, people come in thousands and thousands of people come to the, this event. So it's sad to not be able to have it in person, um, but it, we can't have it in person this year. So um, we will be doing an online version like we did last year, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, so there'll be some pre and post kind of um, workshops, if you will, how to call moose, and there'll be some other activities or other events around the moose lottery besides just the reading of the names, which of course will read all, all the names. And, um, and there'll be other kind of educational opportunities for folks to engage in um, during that event and, and, and following the event as well. It's also important to note that in addition to the regular moose um, lottery, there is uh, an adaptive moose hunt this year. So this hunt will happen in WMD4 or half of WMD4. And the goal of that program, I think, and I'm not gonna do this justice in, in 
the amount of time, but <laughs> I think most folks know the department's been studying moose survival uh, and mortality and survivorship for the past seven years. And um, our phenomenal moose biologist, Lee Cantar, has worked with other biologists in, in Canada and New Hampshire and Vermont and um, have radio callers on moose, yearlings and cows trying to uh, determine how many cows or how many calves are surviving through the full year, along with how many cows survive from year to year. And then likewise, how many calves each cow is producing. So um, the shortened version is that we believe that winter tick, which is a tick specific to moose, is causing a, an unusual mortality rate for calves. So just for the, for the young of the year, um, the cows are surviving at, at the normal rate. However, they're not producing as many calves as they used to produce. So we believe that the limiting factor for moose in through much of their range, particularly the southern part of their range in Maine, is the winter tick. And so um, if you just kind of think of any parasite, like the more people in a small area, the more likely you are to, like if, if I had lice and 20 people were in my office here, we'd all probably get lice. Um, but if I'm here by myself, I'm probably not going to share it with anybody. So our goal in this project or this portion of the hunt is to, we've added additional permits to a very specific zone. And there are very specific criteria around that hunt. And it's a cow only hunt. The goal is to reduce the moose population in that very small, it's one sixth of the total moose habitat in the state to try and reduce the population to see if we can increase productivity of the cat of the cows so that the, the cows start producing more twins as they used to. And likewise, if the, the calves survive at a higher rate than they are now. So that will also be part of the lottery uh, on June 12th. You did no. a good, that's a complicated <laughs> thing to explain. And I'm not the moose biologist. So. <laughs> and uh, so, but I it, think we have a video with Lee explaining it. So if folks several, want all the details, yes. should listen. Yeah. To so if you're interested in learning more about the adaptive unit and the adaptive hunt and more about this study that Lee has been conducting, you can watch several presentations, which we'll post the links to. So he goes through moose management. He talks about myths mm -hmm. about moose talks extensively about winter tick and why that's not like deer tick and dog ticks. It's a, a species of tick that's very unique to moose. Um, and then some of the other things that people have suggested, such as flea and tick collars for moose or um, yeah. prescribed burns, those types of things. So he kind of addresses some of those questions and concerns that people have in those presentations. So I encourage everyone to watch those. We also did a podcast mini series that was all about the adaptive hunt, in-depth interviews with Lee, uh, with Nate Webb, our, uh, our wildlife director. And uh, there's a couple of other folks in there too, talking about the, the moose uh, management and the winter tick issue. So I encourage everyone to listen to those episodes as well. So Judy, let's talk a little bit about hiking safety and oh. getting outside. Cause there have been some, I have seen some search and rescue things yep. going on. I know a lot of people are excited about the warm weather. They yep. kind of get outside and maybe they're not as prepared as they need to be. What are some things for people to keep in mind? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, it's similar basics to like when you go out boating, make sure people know where you're going, make sure you kind of have somebody at home that knows where you're going to be or um, where you think you're going to be in. Um, you know, there are like, I, I'm surprised how many times our wardens recover people that are hiking significant mountains in like sneakers and, and Crocs and totally inappropriate footwear. So, you know, have the appropriate gear for the activity you're doing. If you're gonna go on a long hike, get some hiking boots, maybe think about some walking sticks, um, have a backpack, have water, you know, have an old fashioned compass. So if your phone, your GPS doesn't work, you have a way to find your way out. Um, you know, make sure you have warm clothes, dress in layers and bug repellent, sunscreen. Um, you know, it's not, it's not that complicated, but people forget you get comfortable and you sometimes get a little complacent and, um, you know, you don't think about all, all the, 
you know, sort of things that might happen. And when I first started in Region A, um, you know, my counterpart or my coworker, Norm Forbes, used to regularly hound me for what do I have in your backpack? Do you have a knife in your backpack? Do you have a compass in your backpack? Do you have waterproof matches in your backpack? Do you have enough water to survive a couple of days? Like he was constantly, no matter what we did, always, always, you got to have those things. Do you have a headlamp? Do you have, you know, what do you have in your pack? Do you have, is there, you, you know, you should have like, and, and that's really good stuff to have. And just to have your know, sunscreen, all that stuff, because it, when something goes wrong, you want that backup. Um, and, you know, I think it's important too, to make sure kind of know where you're going and have the trail, have the route mapped. And, um, and, you know, for me, what, and I, so I'll just confess that I'm not like, I'm not unfamiliar with getting turned around on a trail. <laughs> so I, I have a good friend that I hike a lot with. And so, you know, we'll, we'll have the map and we'll be like, wait a minute, mm, we're not, this is not where we think we're supposed to be. And so I go back to the last known place where I know I knew where I was on the map um, and kind of re-figure out where you need to go. So I pay pretty close attention to, you know, the, the blazes on the trees or on the trail um, and make sure that you are where you think you are. And we all make mistakes. And I'm the first to admit that I have come out on a trail and not where I thought I was going to be. And I'm like, oh, this is not actually near my car. <laughs> um, and it, it, it can, ha it happens, right? It, you know, sometimes the trail maps are confusing or the, the blazes are different than you think. So, you know, don't, don't panic, stay calm and, and, you know, just, um, this time of year, the nice thing is that the length of day is expanding. So you've got plenty of time to um, get back to safety. And, um, but, you know, I really encourage people like there's so much going on right now. There are so many birds out. All the wildflowers are starting to come out. It's such a great time to be outside that, you know, start if, if you're new to hiking, start with a small two, you know, two mile hike, start someplace close to home that you're familiar with and, and just grow and, and, build on that. There's, um, there's so many opportunities and, um, is it, is it main trail finder? That's the website that I, I use a lot that helps me figure out. And you sort of, you know, put up so many miles within Freeport or wherever you may live and gives you various options. And that's a great tool for, um, pointing out new places. And, and I usually during the pandemic, we had so many people visiting, these sites that you would get there and the parking lot will be full like this there's no place to park so you can't really park illegally for a whole bunch of reasons but you know have a second have a backup place ready if if the you know the trail parking lot's full then then find a new place to hike and um be adaptable have a plan a plan b plan c and um but get out you know go out there and and look at the flowers and listen to the birds and there's so many, like, there's so many behaviors right now with wildlife. Everybody's like breeding or um, courting. And so there's so many things to see, like the birds are doing so much and they're talking to each other and they're displaying and they're trying to, you know, like they're trying to mate. And so they're trying to woo their mate and it's so much fun to watch. I, I just think it's the best time of year to if you're new to the outdoors, it's such a great time. And right now there's still not any, really any bugs out yet. So another plus for this time of year, in a couple of weeks, they'll start to get buggy. So um, make sure you have bug spray and tick repellent. Yes, all great points. So a question just came in and it's sort of relevant to the, the topic that we're on right now. And you touched on it a little bit earlier, but if someone doesn't fish or hunt, how can they support the department and, and some of the great work that we do? So there's lots of ways that you can participate with the department. The department has a whole host of um, community science programs where you can participate in, say, the Bird Atlas or Bumblebee Atlas, or um, do we have rep reptile and amphibian surveys that folks do. We have uh, volunteers that work on the Plover Project. There's volunteers that help with a whole host of different um, projects that the department oversees. So there's there are those ways that you can contribute like of your time and learn more and 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 engage more physically directly um with those opportunities but there's lots of ways that you can also help the department in and you know um the loon license plate is a great or the wildlife license plate both of those support department programs and particularly non-game programs 
Um, we actually have a little birder band. Um, my binoculars aren't on my desk here, but um, we have a little birder band that you can buy. It's like the size of probably a um, like a turkey band that you might find on a turkey, and that that goes to support our uh, bird programs in lots of things like the Atlas and many of the other surveys that we do, the Peregrine surveys and the Eagle surveys, and goes to support all those programs. The Tickety Checkoff on your tax form, Outdoor Heritage Fund is a great way to support all kinds of conservation projects um, statewide. So that's the little scratch ticket you can get um, at the gas station and dedicated those funds go to the Outdoor Heritage Fund, which I sit on the board of that. And we review, oh, last, last round we reviewed, I think through 27 different conservation projects um, around the state. Some of it's land acquisition, some of it's direct management, some of it's law enforcement related. Um, and so, that money, I think, has given out, that program has given out, I think, $22 million uh, in its lifetime for conservation projects across the state. And that goes to the state, but also to lots of nonprofits benefit from those as well. Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, Maples Heritage Trust, lots of different um, nonprofit partners can apply and take advantage of that. So there's lots of ways to engage um, with the department if you want to participate physically or make a donation. There's lots of opportunities or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And, and that's a great way to keep track of what the department's doing and what we're up to. And that's where we post a lot of the fishing stocking reports and all this kind of stuff gets posted on those, um, those avenues as well. And also the outdoor partners program is a right. great thing to get involved with. Yes, yes, thank you. So that program particularly helps us focus on some of our landowner relations and make sure that all the activities that we manage happen on on private land. And so it helps the department to make sure we have the resources that we need to assist the landowners if they're having issues, concerns, problems. We have staff here that will um, go and help the landowners. We also have staff dedicated to help landowners with habitat management or make recommendations on harvest, all kinds of things like that. So it's a great program um, and uh, helps in many ways. Yeah, we had uh, one of our landowner relations corporals on the coffee chat last week, actually. Yeah, so yeah. if you missed that, you can tune in and hear about the great work that uh, he's working on for Maine's landowners and, and how you can get involved in that and also just be a good land user. Right. Responsible recreation. That's the, that's the new tag word. <laughs> so uh, we did have a, some questions come in specific to turkey hunting. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but what a good opportunity spring turkey hunting is. And if someone's looking for more information about bag limits and opportunity, mm -hmm. where can we, they go on the website? Sure. So um, all that info should be on our website. I, the bag limit is two um, through most of the state in um, two toms. You get mail only. So, and the turkey season, this comes up quite a bit. Um, the, why our season doesn't start earlier and, um, so we are working with the university on a sort of a phenology, a timing study for our tricky season to make sure that the tricky season is appropriately timed. And the reality is getting, we hear people say, oh, the toms are all displaying, the females are on eggs, it's too late. We actually want the females to be on eggs by the time the tricky season starts because we don't want to interrupt the females breeding. So the tr our tricky season is a little bit later. Massachusetts start, started last, started, whatever, a couple of days ago, I think. Um, it, it is a little bit later than some other states, but that is designed to make sure that our turkeys are um, able to successfully breed. So there's still ample opportunity. There's still toms displaying and fanning out and drumming, and you'll see the males kind of strutting and dancing around each other for weeks still. So there's plenty of opportunity to hunt turkey. Um, and so I would encourage you to go on our website and all the rules and regulations around turkey hunting are listed in the hunting law book, which you can get on our website and um, in, in specifically for your area. In the fall, there's actually a little bit even more opportunity. In the fall, we allow uh, harvest of any turkey. In some parts of the states, it's one or two. In other parts of the states down here where I live in Southern Maine, it's up to five. So there's lots of opportunity for turkey hunting. Um, and some things that what I like, which I'm not really saying that good at, but I like trying to call the turkeys in. So I have a little box call that I use because I can't do the, the tongue one yet. But um, 
you know, you can practice that and you, you do kind of probably want to be in a blind. I think it's a lot easier to say turkeys are remarkably, uh, they have tremendously good eyesight. So they can see you any kind of movement, they're going to detect it. And as as sometimes I think people, at least I, when we, I first started turkey hunting, I thought it was going to be so easy. I had nightmares that I was going to just accidentally shoot too many birds. Um, and that you know, it took, takes so long to even get close to them because they're so actually wary. When you see them out in the field, you think, oh, this would be so easy. I'll just sneak out there. They're, 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 they're smarter than you think. And they're definitely wary and aware. So a blind, if you have one is really helpful. If not, you definitely need camo. Um, that's especially important, I think, maybe for children getting out. They can be yeah. fidgety. I know uh, Liz Thorndike, our fisheries biologist, who we frequently have on these panel discussions and chats, she will often bring up how wiggly her son gets with excitement, and having a ground blind is absolutely yeah. essential for that. Yeah. Yep. So, Judy, you mentioned earlier in the conversation ways that we can, uh, the public can support the department if they're not uh, an angler or a hunter. And we talked a little bit about uh, how birders can support the department. Now, I know there are some, I don't know if they're called citizen science, but ways that anglers can participate uh, with some of the research and work that fisheries does. Yes. So they do creel surveys. And so we have uh, staff that go around and we've got anglers across the state that kind of keep track of what they're seeing and when and when they're fishing, how many hours they were fishing. And so then the department uses all that data to try and get a handle on kind of what the fish population is, the size categories in the different um, lakes and ponds that they're managing. So there's certainly opportunities for folks to engage with um, fisheries resources as well. Um, and I think most of those, uh, the explanation for those should be on our website as well. And we do have, we have the log books. You had mentioned right. something about writing down all the birds you see. I right. know that there are anglers that write, they can write down the fish that they, yep. they catch, I'm pretty sure, and, and yep. send that into their regional biologist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Most anglers I know are pretty fastidious about, about keeping logs and how many fish they caught on what date, where. So that information is really helpful for the department. And I, I probably should have asked this earlier, but when we were talking about the any deer permits, uh, should should people be, when should people be expecting uh, those changes that you mentioned? Oh, so we won't present that to the legislature till next January. So, and, and then it'll be up to them to decide what they may or may not want to move forward with. So um, let's just work through it. If we, we present to them in um, January. So the way the legislature works is that all the laws that are passed are 90 days after the, the day the legislature closes. So if they end, say, May 15th, um, all the laws that were passed wouldn't take place for three months, so May, June, July, August. So it, it, depending on what changes they make, they might, um, my guess is they would recommend that um, any changes wouldn't actually happen until the following January to allow the department to make the necessary adjustments in our, you know, our all our permit systems and that sort of thing. So, but it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly when anything might happen, but it won't be before, it won't be for this fall and it won't be before um, next year. Thank you so much. Well, we are coming to the hour um, point of our conversation today. Yes. Judy, do you have oh, any yes. final thoughts for the folks who are watching at home? No, I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining and I hope to see you out in the field. I try to get out as often as I can. Um, for me, it's mentally, it's physically helpful, but it keeps my head clear and keeps me connected to what we do. So um, I hope to see you all out in, in the future and um, please stay tuned and, and join us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and um, stay engaged with us. And if there are things that you need from me, you know, I tell our staff all the time, I'm, I'm here, my job is to take care of you. So I'm, I'm, I work for you. So if there are things that you need that you think we should be doing, just please let, let us know and, and we'll do what we can to address those um, issues or ideas or opportunities. So thanks everyone for joining and hope to see you all soon.
Thank you so much, Judy. And so I will say uh, thank you to everyone at home for, for watching us and Judy for joining me again on uh, this special coffee chat. I hope to have uh, Judy on again soon, probably yeah. when uh, we get some more, uh, maybe closer to hunting season in the, in the, the fall hunting season yeah. talk and get a little check in then as well. I'd like to remind everybody that we will be continuing with our spring presentation series, working with Maine's reptiles will be on May 10th oh. at 1 p.m. And we did post the link to that in the comment section. So if you're interested in joining us for those, those spring presentation series and asking our staff your questions, that's a great time to do so. And uh, thank you everybody for, for joining um, me and Judy today for coffee. And I hope everyone has a great weekend.